Hey guys, this is Nicole Van Tassel with iExplore Science, uh, creator of iExplore Academy, and that is our program to help teachers transition to three-dimensional instruction and divine design and GSS aligned curriculum. Uh, okay, so we are talking about tech tools for engaging with phenomena here. So these tools that I'm going to share with you, you may already be using. They, um, they've been around for a while, and so that's honestly a good thing. But my goal is to show you how you can use them to support three-dimensional instruction, in particular to engage with phenomena. So really briefly, um, phenomena, what are we doing with it in our units? Typically, we use phenomena to um, early in our storylines to engage students, so to pique their interest, to activate prior knowledge, and to get them wondering, to be asking questions, um, maybe making hypotheses. They are just thinking about the situation. And then we come back to that phenomena later in our storylines to explain it. So students are working through your NGSS storylines to come back and explain this phenomena. It provides a rationale for their learning. That said, we are also using phenomena as a way for students to explore things and to make connections, um, or we are using phenomena to assess students, to understand what they really know. They're not just spitting back facts, they're actually applying it to the phenomena. So we can understand that they have mastered the concepts and they have um, and they're able to um, apply their mastery to a new situation. So that's going to show true learning. Um, when we're working with phenomena, we need to present the phenomena. We need to give students opportunities to engage with it and we need to provide students opportunities to share and discuss their questions and their ideas. So the tech tools that I'm going to be sharing with you are going to help your students engage with this phenomena in those different ways. Something I would like you just to remember is keep it simple. Don't um, feel like you need to use every single tech gadget or element of these tools. A lot of the tools have a lot of cool things you can do with them, and that's awesome, and we should use those, but don't feel like you need to use them all at once. So keep it simple, don't overwhelm yourself or your students. Um, when possible, use familiar tools. If you're already using some of these tools, just continue doing that. So we want to, again, reduce the friction of learning and sometimes introducing too many new tools can can provide some of that friction we don't want that to happen and then lastly don't feel like you need to try everything at once don't do all of these things um the first like right away you know introduce if you're going to introduce a new tool which is awesome do maybe do one this week we're going to try this tool and then we're going to use that tool next week again and then maybe you introduce another tool later on so don't feel like you need to do everything at once again we want to keep it simple okay so Pear Deck is a really um great presentation tool that you can use in a regular classroom but it also works really well for online settings because you can set it to this um student paced version so if you're experiencing a closure you can get the premium features for free. I don't know all of the details. You have to go to their website and um, look into it and contact them. But I just want you to know that. If you are using Pear Deck, uh, you can get the fee premium features free right now if you're experiencing a closure. Okay, so how can you use Pear Deck to actually engage with phenomena? First of all, you can use Pear Deck to guide students through questioning. A lot of times in our classroom, we give our students a phenomenon or we show it to them, they engage in it in some way, and then they start questioning. But it's not just, our, our role doesn't end there. We are walking around and we are um, asking students questions about their questions. We are making observations to help them develop new questions. We can do that with Pear Deck. You could show students a, a phenomenon, so maybe a video or an image, or you could even give instructions like sit here and think about your, um, sit here and notice what's happening in your body. And students might make observations about their breathing and their heart rate and things that they're feeling. And then you might give them another instruction on another page that says do 25 jumping jacks. And then again, think about what's happening to your body, make some observations, develop some questions. So you can use phenomenon in many ways and you can do that with Pear Deck. 
So you might give them the, the image, the video, the instructions, and then you insert your own questions that students respond to. So maybe it's initially record some observations about X, Y, Z. Um, but maybe it's then you add another question and you say, what is one thing you're wondering about? And then you guide it further by pointing out something on the slide and asking students to um, write down what they already know about that thing, whatever it is. So you can really guide their questioning process, their observation process, all of that with Pear Deck. Now for explorations, Pear Deck is really awesome as well. Um, and so that would be, sorry, that would be like scaffolding the questions. We're going a little bit out of order with the slide. But exploration, you can actually embed simulations right in Pear Deck, which is amazing because it prevents too many boxes open or losing your students. So you can embed the simulation and then you can embed questions or you can put the questions right on that page. So students don't have to bounce between a Google document and a simulation. Um, they also, you see all of their questions at once in one location as they are answering those questions. Um, another way that you can scaffold that is uh, recording yourself manipulating the simulation. So you might, instead of embedding the simulation, maybe you embed a video of you manipulating the simulation and then there are questions that guide students through understanding that simulation. You can track their work, you can see their responses, they can also if you provide an image or a map or something like that, they can write their ideas, they can draw right on the screen, which is a different way to um, engage students in interacting with a phenomena. So maybe you give them an image and they uh, and you ask them to draw what they think is happening here or what ways ma matter is moving through this image. Maybe it's an image of a um, like a safari kind of scene and a cheetah is hunting down a gazelle. Maybe they are drawing right on the image what they think is happening in terms of energy and matter moving in that system. That's a great formative assessment, whether you're using it at the end of the unit or you're using it at the beginning to engage students in, in that phenomenon. So Pear Deck is really cool. It's great for formative assessment um, and you can go beyond just multiple choice. You can go beyond just texts. You can actually involve those like image, the drawing, the images, the diagrams, things like that right with that program. Okay, so Flipgrid is another one that's really fun and this one is great for meaning making. Um, so those meaning making discussions, the consensus building discussions, it's super engaging. Basically students record their ideas um, so they don't have to write out their, in a typical classroom, we would engage our students in a discussion. Online, that's more difficult. It's also more difficult because we need to oftentimes do it asynchronously, meaning that our students are not all participating in a discussion in the same time. You know, if you don't have like a group meeting time. So this allows you to do that, but still not lose that face-to-face -face component and that ability to actually speak your ideas instead of write your ideas. So it avoids the text fatigue. It can be good for, you know, scaffolding for students who don't like to write, aren't maybe good at, you know, good at writing. Um, they can still communicate in a way that's more comfortable to them. So basically they record their ideas, their a video. It's engaging because they can add like stickers and other elements, all of that. So you're really going to get some fun interaction from students. It's motivating them to, to do this and to, and to participate. So what would you do? I would say you would post your phenomenon as a topic. Maybe it's an image, a video, a recording, you talking about something, uh, a discussion question, whatever. And then you're going to ask your students to actually go back and explain that phenomenon in some way. To Encourage students to actually engage in discussion. Instead of having them all post their individual responses, I would encourage them to post replies. So they really have to build from what was said before them. So students would, if Susie came on first and saw the assignment first, she would post her response and she would be the first one to go. But then when Paul comes onto the class website, instead of just posting his response, he actually has to click Susie's and you would give them these instructions. This is not something they have to do. I'm just suggesting you frame your discussion in this way. 
So he would click Susie's, he would have to listen to her response, and then he would have to reply to Susie. So whatever he says is in response to what Susie said. So maybe he is agreeing with her and providing some additional ideas, some additional insights, some additional observations. Maybe he's disagreeing with her and he's offering his alternative idea. And then when um, Patty comes in on later, she has to watch Susie and Paul's videos and then respond to theirs. Um, and then you can also engage in this where you can respond and ask a question. Uh, and then your students, you are part of that discussion now too. So it's just this ongoing asynchronous discussion like you would, it's like you would have in the classroom, but it's from home and it's um, asynchronous. So you can also do some cool things with Flipgrid, if somebody had a really awesome response that you want everybody to make sure they see, you can spark this response and it will make sure it like adds a notation that this is something you want everyone to see. You can also provide vibes feedback for everybody. So this is where you could, somebody says something and you offer a challenge or you offer an observation and you ask students to figure out how does that tie into what Paul said. Uh, and then lastly, you can also provide private feedback for students. And what's really nice is you can do it in video form. So you can just do a quick recording of your face, to write, provide the feedback. And it kind of mitigates the like, well, what tone are they using? Um, one of the teachers in I Explore Academy was talking about she was concerned because she likes to ask questions like, well, I don't know, what do you think? Or she likes to challenge students' ideas. And sometimes that can come across uh, in text a little bit more negatively than it can, you know, in your tone and in your conversations with students. So this allows you to um, actually, for students to hear your tone. And so it, ke it creates those like more positive interactions. So that's Flipgrid. Okay, Edpuzzle is a little bit more complicated, but it's a, a cool tool for creating these like interactive lectures. So, or for, inter um, again, guiding students through observations and generating questions. So first of all, you might use Edpuzzle, present a phenomenon, maybe it's a video or maybe it's an image. This could work really well for videos. A lot of times when our students watch a video, they watch the whole thing and then they write down some ideas at the end. In a classroom, we could obviously pause it as we're going through the video and have them ask questions or um, make comments or activate prior knowledge and so on and so forth. Online, that's not going to happen unless students do it themselves. Edpuzzle can force students to do that. So you start playing the video and I used the phenomenon the other day of a tornado forming. So it was a three minute video. There was no explanation in it. It was just, maybe it wasn't even three minutes, but it was just watching this tornado form. There were some people talking in it because they're the ones recording it. So I might, you know, 30 seconds into the video, pause and ask students to record some observations about what does the sky look like. Um, record some observations about the tools that the scientists are using. There's like a radar map there. And then I would, they would record their observations and then they would continue the video. And I might ask, um, pause it again and make an observation myself or ask another question. So again, you can guide the questioning and the observations so that you're scaffolding it and helping your students generate more observations and better observations, more questions, better questions. You can also use this, like I said, for interactive like videos and lectures. So in a typical NGSS style of lecture, the goal is always to be building off of student ideas. We can't do that so much when we're recording a lecture on, you know, a, a class um, online like here. So Edpuzzle can allow you to, um, it doesn't quite allow you to build from student ideas because it's not necessarily live, it's student paced, self paced but you can incorporate opportunities for students to provide some feedback about their thinking, about um, what, what they might have written down. You can just basically make it more interactive. So that also makes it a really good formative assessment. Um, you can also use Edpuzzle for practice. So as students are going through this interactive lecture where you're reviewing information with them. You can input questions that ask them to apply that information that was just on the slide or that they just heard to the phenomenon. So that's going to take this questioning to a higher level because now we're not just spitting back the ideas that were just said to them, but it's actually asking them to transfer those ideas. 
Um, so how it applies to the phenomenon. And again, the question formats, they can be multiple choice or they could be open-ended. So it does allow you to do like very quick formative assessments with multiple choice of like basic facts and ideas, but then also keep, do that more complicated transferring and all of that um, by creating open-ended questions. Okay, and the last tool that I want to share with you is um, Padlet. And first of all, I love Padlet for organizing online learning. Uh, check out the previous training uh, last week on using pat like short storylines in your distance learning classes because I outlined how I would use Padlet to do that. But Padlet can also be used for consensus building and argumentation and as a driving question board. So for consensus building, you can post a phenomenon and students can then go on and add like little boxes that explain the phenomenon or support even for argumentation support the claim. So in there and they would add cards and they might put evidence from an investigation they did or from a text that they read or from some sort of activity that explains that phenomenon or supports that claim. And then students could see everybody's ideas on that board. So it's very much consensus building in that way or argumentation in that way. You could also set it up as like a um, arguing for one idea or an arguing against an idea. So you could have the argue, like the evidence that supports it and the, and the ideas that are supporting the claim. And then you could in, um, involve students in maybe students who have other ideas can put it on a different a different column or a different size. So you can see both sides of an argument or and the evidence that supports each side of an argument. Uh, and then lastly, you can do like driving questions boards. Same idea, you present the phenomenon and you can do that right on there by embedding a video or a picture or something like that. And then asking students to put their questions and their observations right on that board. So again, everybody can see it in the class at one time. Um, and you can add to it over time. Padlet's kind of cool because there's a bunch of different formats for organizing the cards. You can compile geographic data, like for explorations. Maybe it's doing something with tracking some earthquakes and compiling some information about the strength of earthquakes. Um, you could also do a timeline. However, their limit is there's no scale to it. So it's more like a sequence, but that could be something that you use. And potentially you could arrange things as... Um, there's one that's called Canvas, and it allows you to put the boxes anywhere on the screen. It does not, from what I can see, allow you to draw arrows, but I could imagine after you put the boxes anywhere on the screen, you could always do a screenshot, and then students could, uh, maybe in something like pa in Pear Deck, actually draw some arrows that show connections and show basically just relationships between different ideas. So that could be something fun, too, that you can do with Padlet. All right, so thanks so much for hanging out with us today. If you'd like to continue working together, I first of all recommend um, highly you check out our Kickstarter Ha Intro to the NGSS mini course. It's totally free. You just get four emails, quick, short 10 minute videos, plus a planning resource delivered right to your inbox. You can register for that um, at iSportScience.com slash intro. It's also in the header of our Facebook group. Um, you can obviously join us with ISR Academy. We are doing uh, bi-monthly co-planning sessions. We're doing bonus trainings to support our teachers who are currently, some of who are, whom are currently teaching online. So we have really expanded our support, um, especially in this time period. So you can check that out at academy.iexplorescience.com. I will drop those links. And we also have school and district programs, uh, programs customized just for districts for your school. As always, for any of our programs, we recommend you ask your district for funding. Highly believe they should be the one funding your professional development program. So we always encourage our teachers to go that route and about, about half of them do that. So definitely check that out. If you have questions about any of our programs or about how we can support you, um, just reach out. Thanks so much for joining us today and post any questions you have about any of these tech tools and how you can use them to engage students with phenomena in the comments. I'll catch you guys later.